Hello, I'm Matt Davis. This is Beaching's Ghosts. I'm currently on the trail of the second branch of the Stanford and Essendine line. I'm just going under the bridge and behind me is what remains of Upford Bridge Station. It's situated on the line that ran from Stanford to Wandsford. See the railway bridge? So this is the branch that, of the Stamford and Essendine line that went from Stamford to Essendine, the original Stamford and Essendine. Um, which is bizarre because when the, it's very muddy around here, when the, when the line was extended to its second extension to Wandsford, it only went via Stamford, so the Stamford and Essendine line was extended upon but kept the same name. Um, I don't know whether you can see this line of trees here, this is really all that exists beyond, hidden behind the back of an industrial estate. One of the reasons why this section of line, which was the, ones, uh, the Snibson branch of the um, Stamford and Essendine line that ran from Stamford to Wandsford, is that the track uh, ended up into Wandsford facing in the wrong direction, i.e. not towards Peterborough where all of the trade was. So the line soon fell into disrepair and disuse because it faced the wrong way. The same problem that they had on the Stanford Essendine line on the Rye Hall section. But uh, this is the this beautiful bridge is all that remains uh, and of course all of this track work behind me uh, the, the permanent way, there's, there's nothing left here. There's a lovely farmer's track to keep us all going and not much else evidence. The road here has all been lifted up so that the bridge would fit in and cross over the track but other than that there's very little evidence remaining. But then there's not surprising considering the station was closed down in 1929. There is, however, sitting right next to me here, hidden amongst all the undergrowth, the evidence clearly of a platform. Fruity. In a previous video, we visited Bottersford for a section of line that only went into Leicestershire for three miles. In this video, we're looking at a railway that ran from Lincolnshire into Rutland for a total of five miles, but related to this line is an extension which was in the counties of Cambridgeshire and Northamptonshire, and the bit in the middle that is in the unitary area of Peterborough, namely the valley of the river that can be pronounced Nen or Neen, depending where you are. I'll be doing a video about this subject in the future. When the Midland Railway was being planned, it utilised contours as much as possible, particularly the Chater Valley from Manton to Ketton, and then the Welland Valley thereafter, requiring a narrow gap between Stamford and Burley House, the home of the Marquis of Exeter. It is alleged that when entering Stamford, it was required to pass by a corner of Exeter's land, and in doing so, met the wrath of the second Marquis, Brownlow Cecil, who didn't want to look at trains from his house, requiring the line to pass through a tunnel. The third Marquis, William Cecil, dismissed this as poppycock, but no evidence has been provided for either argument. This was in 1849, a year before the railway opened. In the same year, the Great Northern had been out measuring and deciding where their railway should go, from Grantham to London, and which town it should call at, Peterborough or Stamford. The deviation to Stamford would mean an extra two miles on the track build. At the time, the two places were of a relative size, Stamford at 8,000 and Peterborough 9,000. Eventually, the line chose the straighter option and went through Peterborough, opening in 1851, though it did seem inexplicable at the time that Stamford had been missed, mostly by Stamford residents. In order to prove his allegiance to the people of Stamford and to give the town some credit, the third Marquis, who was very much in favour of the money a railway brought, set about building his own railway, which would connect the Midland and Great Northern lines so the people of Stamford could receive goods from either. 
as he was the MP for the area in which it would be built, and he was the primary landowner, it was a relatively easy route to build, except for Stamford itself, where the historically violent Midran Railway already had a station. They planned their own station independent of the Midland. There was much less objection at the northern end to share some 300 yards of track with the Great Northern at Essendine, who agreed to work the line for 50% of receipts. The line was complete in just under four years, a long time considering its five mile length, blaming it on contractors. Gradients were no more than 1 in 160, the river Gwash needed crossing, but there were no other obstacles save a few embankments and cuttings. The Essendine terminus was a bay road at the GNR station. The line opened 1st of November 1856. It had been built to allow for double track. The first year receipts proved it possible and a second track was built. The Board of Trade were unable to sign it off though, as the line could not decide on a safe signalling system, so the second track was eventually removed. Essendine Station did not have the capability for double track. In 1860 another railway terminated at Essendine from Bourne to the north, again with a single track terminating on the main line. Both lines joined the Great Northern from the south. The GNR would not allow any crossings of their main line for connections between the two railways, but yet again worked the line on their behalf for 50% of receipts. The GNR were unwilling to allow a spur to the south, rebuffing the Marquis when he requested such. However, a Bourne spur was approved, but never built. Passengers found it more convenient to change at Peterborough and take the Midland to Stamford as Peterborough offered more options. As a result of this, and Essendine remaining underused for passengers, the board created an extension named Sibson. But, terminating at Wandsford, it too would be facing away from Peterborough. It contained a spur at Stamford to the Midland, and this had the whole bill refused. The next presentation removed the spur to the Midland and Royal Ascent was obtained. Access to the LNWR was granted in 1864. At the time, GNR's contract to run on the first line expired, and as the GNR needed more payment to make it profitable, the Marquis decided to go it alone. On the 1st of June 1866, the Midland gave way and granted a spur from Stamford Station, foreseeing the potential revenue in gaining access to King's Lynn via Spalding. The Sibson extension opened the 9th of August 1867, but pretty quickly became obvious that it ran at a loss. The LNWR wouldn't negotiate their excessive charges to use Wandsford, so the Marquis built a station at Sibson, just north of the junction with Wandsford, and the connection was severed. He asked the GNR to return, and negotiations resulted in the GNR being given 50% of the north line and 70% of the south. By doing so, Wandsford access was reconnected. GNR resumed services in 1872 and Wandsford was accessed from February 1878. From 1894, the GNR leased at a fixed rate until grouping in 1923, where the line transferred to the LNER. The Marquis, board and shareholders gained a 4% debenture. The joy was short-lived, however, as in 1929 the south section was operating at a loss similar to GNR's fixed rate, and the line was closed on the 29th of June 1929. The remaining section stayed in service until just before the beaching report. This timeline is of all the railways that had an effect upon the two branches of the Stamford and Essendine Railway, also known as the Marquis of Exeter's Railway, which focused its services from Stamford in Lincolnshire. On the 1st of June 1845, the London North Western Railway opened their line, intended to connect the London and Birmingham Railway with the Eastern Counties at Peterborough. The line terminated at Peterborough's first station via Wandsford and Castor. Midland's Syston to Peterborough Railway had encountered problems in the Saxby area with the Earl of Harborough, and the line had been delayed, so the section from Peterborough to Stamford was opened first, connecting to a temporary station in Water Street. 
Intermediate stations were included at Walton, Helpston, Bainton Gate and Uffington. At Peterborough, the Eastern Counties line extended their main line from London via Cambridge in 1847, enabling access from Norwich and Brandon. The delayed Midland then limped into Stamford to its correct destination, closing the temporary station to the west of the new station, passing through a tunnel to join the line to Uffington. Luffenham opened March 1848 as a prerequisite for the London North Western building Market Harbour, and Ketton and Stamford followed in May. In October, courtesy of a spur from Peterborough built by the Midland, the Great Northern opened a line to Spalding via Peakirk. In August 1850, favouring Peterborough, the Great Northern opened their town's line from Doncaster to Peterborough and extended further south toward London. In June 1850, the LNWR built the Rugby to Stamford line through Market Harbour and a year later continued to Peterborough from Ruckingham via Seaton. On the 15th of July 1852, the Great Northern opened Essendine Station. In 1853, the Stamford and Essendine Company was formed with the Marquis of Exeter at the helm. In October, Tallington opened on the Towns Line. The short-lived Bainton Gate closed in 1856, having been run from the level crossing buildings. On the 1st of November 1856, the Stamford and Essendine line opened with an intermediate station at Rye Hall and Belmesthorpe. In 1860, Essendine becomes another terminus, this time of the Bourne and Essendine Railway, another single track line. Their railway, like the Marquis's railway, terminates in a bay road but has access to the main line. After initially objecting in 1856, the Midland eventually sees the potential of a spur onto the Stamford and Essendine and connects both ends to the GNR. In another collaboration, the Midland and Great Northern Joint Line joins Peterborough to Sutton Bridge via Wisbeach in June 1866. The Sibson extension to the Stamford and Essendine opens in August 1867, with stations at Barnack, Ufford Bridge and Wandsford. The LNWR charges are unacceptable to the railway, and in 1870 they disconnect and set up a new station just before the junction at Sibson. It lasts for eight years, closing March 1878, and the connection to the LNWR is eventually reinstated. On the same date that the Great Northern and London North Western Joint Line opens in Leicestershire, a spur joins the GNR and LNWR south of Peterborough at Fletton. A month later, avoiding the Midland charges, the LNWR extends their line from Seaton to Wandsford, connecting to Nottingham to Peterborough without using the Midland. Stations also open at Nassington, Kings Cliff and Wakerley and Barrowden. Wandsford is now an important junction station. The railways operate for a number of years through the Boer and Great Wars. However, following the 1923 grouping, the LNER reviewed the use of the Sibson branch and closed it in July 1929. Nassington Ironstone Quarry opens in September 1939 and goes into full production for the war effort. In 1943, Dowmac, now Tarmac, opened a cement works beside Tallington Station. Within five years, they were making pre-stressed concrete products, especially sleepers, under the easy-to-remember name of Tallington Precast Concrete. After the 1948 nationalisation, and to prevent any confusion, the two Stamford stations received on the 27th of September 1950, their individual names, East and Town. East Station seems to have been known locally as Water Street, and the Midlands temporary station was in Water Street. After lack of use and disinterest from the GNR prior to nationalisation, the Bourne and Essendine line closed on the 18th of June 1951. In December 1953, Walton Station closed. 
A number of stations closed following the 1955 modernisation plan. The Wisbeach line closed and the recently renamed Stamford East, making trains to Essendine use the Midland Stamford Town Station. Wandsford and Nassington on the LNWR, now Midland region, also closed. On the 15th of June 1959, after two years of Stamford East closing, Rye Hall and Belmsthorpe and Essendine followed, but the track remained open for freight. On the same day, Tallington closed to passengers. In 1961, Peakirk closed. The remains of the Stamford and Essendine, including the Priory sidings, eventually closed on the 4th of March 1963, three weeks prior to the publication of the Beeching Report. Victims to Beeching followed. The Wandsford to Northampton branch closed in July 1964, Uffington in August, Castor in December. The dreaded 6666 date wiped out many railway beacons in the surrounding counties. In March, Stamford Town reverted to its original name and then the closures of Ketton, Luffenham, Seaton and the line to Market Harbour, Wakerley and Barrowden, Peterborough East and Helpston took effect on the 6th of June. Peterborough North, with the loss of Peterborough East, became simply Peterborough, the original name of its retiring partner. King's Cliff managed to hang on for goods until June 1968 as the terminus, which transferred to Nassington until the last privately owned ironstone quarry in Britain ceased operations in February 1971. As the Nassington line had not been lifted as expediently as Beeching's closures, a heritage railway was considered by some enthusiasts who convinced Peterborough Council to protect the remaining track and reinstate the Fletton Loop in 1974. Following some renovations and track improvements, the Neen Valley Railway ran its first passenger train in June 1977 from Peterborough, Neen Valley Railway, to Wandsford. For a while, the station has been referred to as Peterborough West. Ferry Meadows was an intermediate station. In 1983, Orton Mere joined the line. In April 2007, the line was extended from Wandsford through a 616-yard tunnel to its new terminus at Yarwell Junction. Wandsford remains as the HQ. In June 2017, Ferry Meadows was renamed Overton. I don't have any photographs or access photographs. Do let me know if any of you have got photos of this area because I've had a look online and there are some but they are so heavily copyrighted I can't use them in my videos and I respect photographers copyright. I don't just post willy-nilly like some people do on, on YouTube. Uh, so I'll always get permission from the owner of the photograph. So there's, there's very little evidence remaining here, which is why yours truly is now using a selfie stick and trying to get used to a different way of filming. I hope everybody's well. Thanks for listening. Very much appreciated for your, your continued interest.